In this video, we are going to learn about eco-sensitive zones. In India as well as around the world, the government has protected certain areas which are essential for biodiversity conservation. You can see the places on this world map. And these places consist of national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. The idea is to protect the threatened and endangered species and their habitat ecosystem from hunters and other human activities. Now, eco-sensitive zones are areas around national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. You can imagine this area as a shock absorber. I'll tell you with an example. So this is your house and then you have your compound wall or outer fence, right? The purpose of this wall or fence is to be the first line of defense for your house, if at all any external threat takes place. You don't want anything to strike your house first. It should first strike the outer wall or fence so that you have the necessary time to prepare. In a similar sense, eco-sensitive zones are these outer areas of a higher protected area. The government regulates and manages the activities around such areas so that there is no external harm to the higher protected areas. So this is what is called an eco-sensitive zone or ecologically fragile areas. The area limit of these eco-sensitive zones as per the Supreme Court order is up to 10 km. These eco-sensitive zones are regulated by the central government through Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. They are the ones who come out with new guidelines for the regulation of such areas. The government not only can increase the area beyond 10 km width, but it can also reduce it for mining and other commercial development purposes. A good example of this can be seen in the case of Banargatta National Park near Bengaluru. In 2018, the central government decided to reduce the area around Banargatta National Park by 100 square km. The purpose was to free up more space for mining and commercial development around the rapidly urbanizing Bengaluru city. Incidents like this make you think sometimes the government does not mean what it intends and can still cover up their actions behind the real objective. Anyhow, the basic aim is to regulate certain activities around national parks and wildlife sanctuaries so the negative impacts on the ecosystem can be minimized. But it is also true when these areas come in the way of development, the government can reduce the land area. Now that we know what an eco-sensitive zone is, it's time to understand what are the criteria for demarcating such area. In other words, on what basis the government defines an area as an eco-sensitive zone. First of all, you need to know that these eco-sensitive zones are notified by the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change, which draws its power from the Environment Protection Act of 1986. And when you go on to read this act, there's no mentioning of the word eco-sensitive zones. So how did the government go about it? Now always remember this point. Since the government makes policies, laws and acts, while drafting them, they see to it that the terms and conditions are not strictly defined. In other words, it has to be too vague for the average citizen to understand. And then when it is rolled out in public domain, by giving specific duration for the operation of laws, the policymakers then push for new ideas that can be implemented with limited liability. Now when you look at the Environment Protection Act of 1986, if you go to Chapter 2, General Powers of the Central Government, in that, Section 3 says power of central government to take measures to protect and improve the environment. Within that, read subsection 2, clause 5. It says restriction of areas in which any industries, operations or processes or class of industries, operations or processes shall not be carried out or shall be carried out subject to certain safeguards. Now go to Section 5, clause A. It says, central government can give direction for the closure, prohibition or regulation of any industry, operation or process. With the help of these two sections, central government pushes the idea to create eco-sensitive zones. The same criteria have been used by the government to declare no development zones near the bank of river Ganga and its tributaries. Anyhow, now that you are aware of the sections and clauses, the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change uses it to declare new guidelines and parameters from time to time. In the next step, the government forms a committee. You know why government forms a committee? They call experts from respective fields who can suggest recommendations to strengthen the policies and look after its implementation. For creating eco-sensitive zones, the ministry has asked all states to constitute a committee 
that consists of a wildlife warden, an ecologist, and a revenue department official of the area concerned. The committee then suggests the best methods to manage such zones. They have defined three important categories that need to be considered in defining eco-sensitive zones. They are in terms of geoclimatic features, basically we are talking about the environment, which comes under abiotic attributes. By looking at the words, you can easily figure out what it means, geographic features of a place such as slope, altitude, soil, rocks, etc. Climatic features include rain, snow, number of wet days, etc. Hence, it is important to consider and assess these geoclimatic features while giving permits to carry out any activity in the eco-sensitive zones and see to it that such activities do not harm the ecosystem or make it any more vulnerable. And the second category is biological features. Now this falls under the biotic attribute. The following components have to be considered while demarcating eco-sensitive zones. The richness of the concerned area's biodiversity, population size and distribution of species, total biomass productivity, and then any cultural or historical value of the area. And the third category is social relevance, which include cultural, economic and historical importance of the area. Now this falls under the anthropological attributes. It is important to consider the interest of the civil society and the local bodies, especially the zilla, taluk and gram panchayats. Local area communities are good at identifying ecologically and environmentally sensitive areas. Of course, these perception will vary and it will be based on personal benefit but the committee can get a good idea about the concerned area. So anyhow, these are the three broad categories the committee has to consider before suggesting as well as the best methods to manage eco-sensitive zones. Now we'll see the activities that can or cannot be carried out in eco-sensitive zones. Some of the prohibited activities are commercial mining, setting up of mills and factories that can cause air, water, soil or noise pollution, then establishment of major hydroelectric projects, then commercial use of wood, tourism activities like hot air balloons being flown over the national park, or discharge of effluents or any solid waste or production of hazardous substances. Now what are the activities which are regulated? These are felling of trees, establishment of hotels and resorts, commercial use of natural water, then erection of electrical cables, a drastic change of agricultural system, for example, adoption of heavy machinery and pesticides, and then widening of roads. Now we'll see the activities that are permitted. These are ongoing agricultural or horticultural practices, rainwater harvesting, organic farming, use of renewable energy sources, then adoption of green technology for all activities.